Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Coach's Corner on the Fitter and Faster platform. I'm your host, as always, and today we have a very special guest, the new CEO of the American Swim Coaches Association, a mentor to many, a friend to all in the pool deck, Coach Bill Wadley. Coach, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. This is a pleasure to be here, and and uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing and, and talking a little bit about swimming. You know, I mean, this is what we do, right? Swimming coaches spend their days and nights thinking and, and planning and, and uh, dreaming about how to be the best they can be. Absolutely, and I know you have a lot of energy, and you're ready to get things going here in, in 2020 and 2021. And I want to tell you about a time when I had just started working in the business. I was really fortunate as a very young coach, a second year club coach. I had these four great boys, these four great athletes. And I was with Marist Swim Club. We were at nationals and they had a particularly great swim. And you came right up to me and you congratulated me on their performance. And that type of interaction means so much to young coaches. I remember it like it was yesterday. So to segue, this into our conversation today, I know one of your goals for ASCA is to reach out to those younger coaches. What are some of the things that you've started doing already within the first month of taking the job? Well, that's a good question. I think the most important thing that, uh, that the job that I have is to support coaches and, and coaches education and to encourage and lift coaches up and help them find uh, opportunities for learning and growth that are going to make a difference in their life and their coaching, because obviously we're their service organization. And, and, and my job is to help provide a, what I call a velocity of learning, the VOL. And I think if, if we can provide a, a velocity of learning that's greater than anyone else, that's going to help the coaches be the best they can be and uh, take their team and them, their athletes to the next level of excellence, then that's really what that's what I should be waking up each and every day thinking about doing, you know, and, and one of the most important things you do is recognize excellence. And I, I think sometimes as, as an athlete or a coach, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of people who are reluctant to do that because, you know, they think that maybe it, it somehow demeans them. And the truth is, is that recognizing excellence of others doesn't demean you. As you said, when I walked over to you, it didn't make me feel worse as a coach by recognizing what you'd done well. I think it made me feel good that I was, you know, helping somebody feel uh, special about the things that they had done in that particular moment. And so my job is to recognize excellence when uh, find excellence, find the coaches that are doing special, unique things. And there's a mess of them. We have so many great coaches in America at all levels of club and college, <coughs> excuse me, YMCA and high school that we want to recognize them and we want to find them and we want to promote what they're doing. And we want to take everything that they're doing and share it as quickly as we can with others um, and help lift up the, the greater good. I always say the great thing about this job is I'm uh, it's a coach coaching coaches, if you will. And in reality, it's uh, they've already coached me my whole life. So coaches have coached me my whole life. If I look back in my life and think about how my life was changed, it was changed by the Richard Quicks and the Eddie Reese's and, the you know, Peter Dalens and, you know, and so the, the, the great coaches, the Skip Kinney's, the great coaches of the past have made a difference in my life and they've lifted me up and they've given me a chance to, you know, both share with others, but also do the same thing and, uh, you know, and pay it forward, if you will. So many of us uh, younger coaches, when we were first coming up, you know, ascending in the ASCA levels and getting your level five certification was a really important goal. It was kind of the ultimate to go to the ASCA convention when you finally got that level five ribbon. Talk about what you think you might be doing to encourage coaches to get back on our educational track. So, you know, our certification levels are still uh, recognized around the world and in, in um, most clubs will you know we'll call with a job service and they'll say well we'd like to hire a coach that's a level three and above or a level whatever and above and so it has a recognition level uh historically that can provide value to the coach and to the club <clears throat> and so we're going to continue to have that program and develop that program but we are retooling it so like any if you if you take the nissan automobile for example and and, uh, you know, they're every year they're thinking of a way to make it better. If you take your Chevrolet, they're trying to make it better. And, and so ask and needs to do the same thing. So we're taking our level one school and uh, we've taken it apart, basically. And so in my first week, 
that was my first job was to, to uh, you know, to look at the stroke schools and see how we can get better. So we took levels one and two and we pretty much changed them immediately. And we're uh, on to levels three, four and five now. And, and uh, so we and, and we're creating and looking forward to creating new online content that's going to be uh, coach owned, if you will. So in other words, an uh, example might be, you know, this would be Aska and coach Mike Murray on freestyle. And so it'll be sort of a co-branded uh, online learning. And uh, we'll have a, sort of an introduction. We'll have an introdu uh, introduce the coach, introduce the content of today's course, freestyle, freestyle turns, whatever it happens to be. We'll uh, have a video of the course with the coach's instruction, the coach's drills, the coaches, and we'll have a PDF that the, that the coaches can, uh, can uh, print out. And we'll have a short little, um, you know, um, you know, multiple choice, true, false kind of a, or, or fill in the blank kind of stuff where what did you learn from this course today kind of thing so that we can provide them CEUs, continuing education credits for whenever someone takes these new online uh, education courses that we're building. So my goal is to get two a month. I know that's a little audacious, but I think that's the job is to velocity of learning. So my, if I can, if I'm asking the coaches, you know, and they're asking me, how can I move fast and move forward quickly? That means that I got to move fast and move forward quickly. So that's really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to uh, get as much new content uh, organized and ready to go and put it on the table and then begin to develop it, um, put it in the can, if you will, put it online and then uh, offer it out to the world's coaches. And, and the American swimming coaches are going to be better because we provided something that is not available anywhere in this world you can't buy this video you can't go anywhere else to get it there's only one place you can get it and that's with your coach's uh service organization and so we're excited about that theme you know and but that's just the beginning it's a really exciting time because you're bringing a lot of enthusiasm and energy back to aska so here we are coach we're on the pool deck it's our first year coaching looking back what are you giving those first year coaches for their toolbox? Where are you directing them? What are the things that helped you in those first early years? Well, so if they, if they want to get educated, the number one thing, if you're a new coach is to, you know, you know, come and start doing the online certification modules. Now, the difference between us and USA Swimming is, is as a USA Swimming coach, if you're on the deck, and you're or a Y coach and you have a USA swimming club. If you're on the deck, you have to, you're required to do certain things in order to be on the deck. So those are, those are requirements for on deck coaching uh, by the USA swimming uh, member services, right? Our education is going to be for getting a, helping get a coach to the edge, helping them promote themselves to a next level of job, helping them help the athletes that they serve uh, do better and do well in what they want and achieve their goals. And so the education that we provide is gonna be specifically for the coach to help the coach take the next level of, of, of uh, education for themselves so that they can help those around them be the best they can be. I love it. And what are some things that you did as a young coach to help bolster your own education and to further your knowledge and understanding of the sport and what makes athletes tick? Mike, I think it did the same thing you did and probably most coaches, which is I volunteered. <clears throat> I think you said you volunteered at Stanford a little bit and whether yeah. it was paid a couple bucks, I sort of volunteered and, you know, and every Saturday uh, I was coaching, I was a young coach, just getting started in coaching. Every Saturday I would drive to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I was in the 101st Airborne Division. And that's, that's me and my brother right behind us there. And that's we awesome. both went in the military at the same time. And I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, but I was coaching a swim team at Fort Campbell and also Clarksville, uh, Tennessee, which was 40 miles away from Nashville. And Paul Bergen was the coach there and then eventually Don Talbot. And so what I would do is I would, when Paul was there with Tracy Calkins and Joan Pennington and that group, oh, I think Steve Boltman was the assistant coach at, uh, during some of that time, by the way. Wow. Uh, that's how I met Steve because he was there at that time. We became great friends, but I would go to Nashville and stand on the deck and watch. And I was a fly on the wall as a young person and then before you know it, they offered me to get involved. And before you know it, you know, you, you began to network. And one of our objectives at ASCA is to help our, our coaches uh, network uh, with great, other great leaders in the community 
So, and then when they're at a meet, for example, so every time I would go to a meet then, the Southeasterns at the time, Coach Bergen or whoever it was would introduce me to their friends who were also elite level coaches. And so my game was raised by the people that I, that I hung around with. They're no different than your children. You tell your children, you're only as good as the people you hang out with. And it's the same thing in coaching. You're only as good as the coaches you hang out with. And so I, I, I would ask young coaches to volunteer, to go uh, find a mentor. And so mentoring and networking are two of the significant things that we want to do. So any new member to ASCA, we're going to call them and ask them if they'd like to ha have a mentor. And we're going to encourage them to have a mentor if they, if they would like. And we're going to offer a mentor in their neighborhood, if you will, in their community, whether it be in their state or their region. And then that mentor's job would be to maybe uh, offer them to come to their pool and watch my practice. So maybe you're mentoring somebody and that you offer them to come watch your practice, Mike. And then at some point, maybe you, you'll actually find a time to go and watch a little bit of their practice sometime and give them some feedback. And then on top of that, you know, your relationship will build and grow. And when you see them at meets or events, <laughs> you'll introduce them to all of your friends and compadres. And before you know it, you know, you've, uh, you've improved their networking and you've improved the, their ability to be a better coach. There's no doubt about that, that mentoring piece. And I'm excited that you're looking into creating that program for ASCA. It's something that I think a lot of coaches will be interested in doing and, and opening up their program to other young coaches to, to learn and get some ideas. And then for us older guys to go and visit some of those new programs and see the energy and enthusiasm. Um, you know, mentoring is so incredibly important at a young age. I remember Larry Van Wagner taking me out to dinner with Dave Ferris and John Collins. And uh, boy, I mean, you, you just learned so much. I didn't even have to talk. I just sat there and listened. I had a notepad and I was writing things down. <laughs> Couldn't write them down fast enough. So that, that's really an important part of it. And when we think about mentors, coach, I think there's some reluctancy from some early coaches, from some coaches who are early in their career to reach out to maybe a bigger name. They might be a little bit intimidated. Talk about how they can broach that and get over that initial uh, intimidation and, and open themselves up to working with somebody who's been in the business for a long time. I would think that, you know, the one thing that, that I would say to young coaches out there today is that, you know, really they shouldn't have any fear of approaching somebody, whether it be phone call or email or personally, because the fact that all of those coaches learn from others as well. So no, nobody fell off the, you know, the turn up truck and just became a world-class coach. They, you know, they had to grow and develop and, and find their way to become excellent, just as we have to do ourselves. And so I would say, you know, if nothing else, they should just go up to them and introduce themselves and say, hey, I've, I've, ad I've admired you for the year, for, through the years and I've enjoyed watching your teams. And, you know, I'd love to talk to you sometime about, you know, what you're doing on you know, breaststroke or whatever it is that you think they do well, you know, and so if they can just start that first conversation, I think they'll find that most coaches are really open and willing to help out other young coaches. So uh, go for it, have fun with it and, and uh, be a little bit audacious in your approach. You don't know unless you try, right? You got to, I got to put it out. Be surprised. There. Right. One of the things that I know we're excited about at ASCA is, you know, creating some programming that speaks to ways and strategies that coaches can connect better with the athletes. What are some of the things that you did along your career? And you, you coached 16 Olympians, you coached uh, you know, a multitude of Big Ten champions and NCAA champions. What are some things that you did every day to help create those connections with your athletes? Well, I think the number one thing is you have to uh, always put them first. So the athlete always is first in, in the athlete coach equation. Remember, uh, you're there for the athlete. The athlete's not there for you. The athlete uh, uh, came to your program or joined your program if you're a club coach because they already have a level of respect for what you're doing. And uh, so they're joining your team, your club, your why, your college, because they have a level of respect. And so I think it's important to respect the fact that, you know, that, that they've given something to you from the get go. They're offering uh, themselves up and saying, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm coming to join your team. I, I believe in what you're doing. I'm excited about learning. And I think we have to serve that in, right? So a good listener, uh, I think all great, great uh, leaders have to become great followers first. I think putting the athlete first is, is, is uh, number one. 
but also thinking that, um, you know, never ever approaching things as if we have all the answers. And I think it's easy as a coach or a teacher or even a parent to feel like we have to have all the answers for our children. And I don't think we have to have all the answers and we don't have all the answers. And so I think to actually appreciate it when we don't try to act as if we have all the answers, I think they really look at you and respect the fact that you're not trying to, uh, you know, uh, act as if, you know, you, you know, you have all of the knowledge in the world. And I think Seth Godin put it well when someone asked him uh, on a talk once, I think he was asked, uh, how is it that you do so many things so well and, and you're so excellent, but yet you never, you're so humble. And how is it that you, you still remain humble? And he's, his answer was this. And I think this is a real important thing to remember as a parent, coach, teacher, or educator. His answer is, I've never thought that I had all the answers. And I always, I always feel like I'm sort of average. I always want to be better. And so it's how he's, he perceives himself as always wanting to have some personal growth and knowing that there's something in front of him that he can do better and learn at a deeper level. And so I think we, we want to encourage young coaches to not feel like you have to answer, you know, in other words, don't try to be a doctor and help them with their shoulder. You can say, hey, I saw some exercises. Here's some exercises I've seen. We've got some sports medicine uh, uh, information here for you on shoulder, you know, uh, rotator cuff issues. You can have this. But, you know, uh, I think the mistake that we make sometimes, especially young coaches, is trying to be all things to everyone. It's so true. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I did get a text from Coach Marsh this morning with some Seth Godin uh, quotes. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was working through some of that today. So that, that's pretty funny. Um, the other thing that you touched on, I think, that's so important, Coach, is this idea that a lot of us, and, and full disclosure, especially males, we, we want to be fixers, right? We want to be problem solvers. Um, and some two of the great, uh, two of the great people in our sport right now, Samantha Arsenal Livingstone and Jeff Raker, who have both been on this show, talk exclusively about how we make a lot of mistakes trying to fix everything when sometimes all we have to do is listen. And I think that that's a skill that you develop over time. Is that fair to say? I would. And I was, I would even add some other people in there, Kathy Wickstrand Gayen yes. and, uh, you know, uh, Kathy Eager from Purdue University uh, and, and Susan Teeter. These, these ladies have got it right, you know, and they're an amazing individuals when it comes to uh, helping, you know, the world sort of see that we don't have to try to fix everybody, you know, and it's not our job to try to fix people, but it's our job is to support them and encourage them, listen to them. And I once, Heard John Maxwell say, who's one of my favorite authors on leadership, he, you know, he said that the quote was, uh, how do you know when someone needs, uh, you know, when someone, someone needs encouragement, Mike? Tell me. And the answer was, if they're still breathing. <laughs> as long Very as they're simple. still breathing, they, they need encouragement. So that means at any age, right? you know, any situation, encouragement is always readily accepted. I think that that's another common mistake, right? And as, as we get more and more fortunate as coaches and we develop and you have some athletes that might reach the elite level, I think sometimes we get really overwhelmed with the idea that performance is everything. Performance is the end all. So as a coach who's had multiple athletes at the Olympic level, what are some of the things that you're telling yourself as they're achieving or maybe fail to achieve their ultimate goals that keeps things in perspective? Well, you know, it's a, I'll tell you a funny story. And this is, is, you know, uh, we're never as good as we think we are. And we're never as bad as we think we are. So the day that you think you're really hot and things are just perfect for you and you just got all the answers, it's probably not quite true. <laughs> And the day that you think that you're just a, a total failure, uh, and guess what? That's probably not quite true. And, and so we lie somewhere where in between. I do think this, though, that um, I'll tell you a, a short story. Um, when we won the Big Tens at Ohio State in 2010, it had been 54 years since Ohio State had won the Big Tens. That's a long time, right? 54 years. And we won the Big Ten sort of going away that weekend. And, you know, I think the, the, the number was pretty significant. And by the end of the middle day, uh, Saturday, after prelims, 
we sort of felt like we could have done no wrong and you know and everybody was hitting everything and everybody was getting in the finals or consolation finals and we were really just thriving right we just we were just dialing it in and everything was and every time someone hit a good a good swim of course another one hit a good swim and it became contagious of course right the whole time i was convinced that we were going to win uh and that we didn't really need to even show up the next day right and the only thing i could think of during that event and and during that time frame was you know there are people on this deck that uh, like myself who was i was getting ready to experience what being a champion meant right who have never experienced this moment that i'm feeling right now or the exhilaration or the thrill or the the honor or the 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 you know the memories that this moment creates and so i was really sort of uh, uh quietly retrospective thinking about those who hadn't also were on the deck who had not achieved it and sort of feeling for them a little bit you know that man i sure hope one day that these coaches because i love these coaches get to feel the same thing that i'm feeling right now because it was special it was uh, unique uh it's um, you know the you know um, winning uh, is it normal by Keith Bell? If you remember that book, winning isn't normal. It's really true. And how many people actually get a chance to win a championship or a big 10 title or a, a national title or a Southeast conference title? How many people get to walk away? There's great athletes who went through those uh, wonderful schools with great coaches that never won. And to say that you won for a moment in your life is definitely a pinnacle. And it's a moment to, that you'll, uh, that will live with you forever. But it also is a moment to reflect and, and realize that, you know, that this is a blessing and, an, and a moment in life that, you know, that came to you, uh, that you didn't, you know, earn it all yourself. These are these, it, this is these athletes. So the only thing I can think of is, you know, that team. So I, I don't wear my Big Ten championship ring very often. You won't see it on me very often. I typically only wore it when I was recruiting. <laughs> right. It's, tell yeah. the story. And, you know, uh, but I really don't wear it because I sort of feel like, it's not mine. It's the teams. And I don't own that championship. They own that championship. And I sort of, to this day, I feel a little bit humbled by the fact that I had the opportunity to be with a, such a great group of young people who did such something of uh, that level of excellence, you know. And, and two things I want to mention about that, because in the swimming world, us club coaches are so plugged into everything. And when you see that Ohio State made that breakthrough in 2010, that it was awesome. And it, and it was a moment that I think a lot of people remember. Um, you know, the other thing that you talked about was that the championship is the athlete's championship. And uh, you're absolutely right. Not all of us are lucky enough to participate in a team championship or win an individual championship. I was fortunate to be part of teams that did but I will tell you unequivocally that winning a championship as a head coach meant so much more to me because it was about them, right? And, and when we think about, we were able to create a dynamic where the kids could be successful, enjoy the process and be champions at the same time. And it's not gonna happen every season. It's, it's it, you know, when it does, that's extraordinarily rare. But when you get your moment in time, boy, it's special. And, and, and it helps bring up the next generation of athletes, right? It does. Well, if you look now, uh, Ohio State Swimming now, it's sort of become from the time we won and the year or two before that until now, they've never been on the top three in the conference. And it's typically in my final year, we tied, we tied Michigan. I'll never forget it. Uh, to the point. 1360 how do you tie somebody with 1360 something points <laughs> after four days of racing how is that possible but you know that's how competitive this world of swimming we are in really is you know and so our elite clubs our elite colleges our elite uh, ymcas our elite high schools those guys are in the they are uh, in for the time of their lives but the challenge is a amazing challenge and when i was coaching club we didn't count championships either. It was more along the lines of individual excellence and what kind of team spirit did we have and did our team thrive together and did we work as one team? And so, um, you know, it wasn't about winning. And at Ohio State, when you're in a conference or a league or a high school league or a YMCA league, 
they do have a championship and somebody's going to win it and somebody's not going to win it. <laughs> I always said, so some, somebody gets ninth at every Olympic games. Somebody gets ninth at every Olympic games and nobody knows who they are. I know one because I had one get ninth and he got ninth by just a, a hundredth of a, of a second in the 200 meter back, 200 meter backstroke. And he'd missed the, the being able to walk out in the Olympic final that close. And in 96, you know, he was, I think maybe 13th or 11th. And then he was ninth in 2000. Um, but it's amazing to me how those small differences can really make a huge difference in the life or the, and impact a, a young person. You know, it changes your life for the, you know, uh, in a, a big way. And if you aren't smart about it, it could change your life in a, in another way where maybe you think that you really, you know, you, you really didn't achieve what you, you know, what you, you deserved, you know, which, you know, I was in, and when I was at the University of Alabama in 1980 or 79, I think there was a young man on the team there by the name of Carlos Barakal who had uh, won a medal, you know, and, and, but uh, we were teasing in the weight room. We were playing this game called Trivial Pursuit and we were saying, okay, who, who is the gold medalist in the 200 backstroke? Who is the, you know, the silver medalist in the 100 backstroke? And, and, uh, and, Anybody know who was, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the silver medalist in the in a hundred backstroke? And somebody said, uh, no. And and I said, jokingly, well, that's because nobody cares, right? And but in reality, we do care, and it's pretty special. But the guy who won, who was, who uh, just missed that final, that 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 uh, bronze medal, was in the room that day in that in that hundred backstroke, and that was Carlos Barrio, you know. And so, you know, you think about you know, how close it is in our sport and how many opportunities, uh, very few opportunities that people have to put their hand on the pad first. It's just a very uh, challenging thing. And you know, I saw today that Jason Lezak is 45, turned 45 today. And you think about Jason Lezak. It seems like yesterday, that relay, right? Beijing Olympic Games and what he did. And that 46 second split, I believe it was, you know, yeah. supposedly one of the fastest splits of all time still today, you know, pretty amazing. And, and, you know, it's crazy to think about, Coach, because, uh, you know, the hard is often what makes this sport so great. And and because it takes such a process, it's not easy for every athlete. I was really struggling my freshman year at Rutgers, and I was talking to our friend Chuck Warner, and he said, you know, Mike, this challenge is what makes the sport great. And something as simple as that changed my whole mindset right? It's, it's the hard moments that make it great. And your athlete who got ninth, that's a world-class athlete who, who's been at the top level of the sport his whole life, you know? And I talked to Marius last week on Coach's Corner. Marius went in 13th in 88 in prelims, and he broke the Olympic record in the morning. And then at night, he got fifth. And he said, it was the best day of my life. That's awesome. I made the top eight. That was my dream goal. So anything on top of that was great. But imagine going from 13th and then, you know, being the number one seed with the Olympic record going in at night, getting fifth, and then still saying to yourself, this was the best experience in my life. So I think it's important to keep perspective. How, how have you helped your athletes keep that perspective? Well, I think, as you say, I think it is important to keep perspective because, uh, as I say, winning isn't normal. It's very rare that someone wins. Uh, and I, I like and I, I always like to take everything and go back to academics. So I, in a collegiate setting, I always try to refer back to academics and life. And so I would say to somebody, well, if you're the third best dentist in town, are you are you a bad dentist? If you're the third best engineer in town, are you a bad engineer? How about if you're the seventh best engineer in town? Are you a bad engineer? And so, okay, so how many of you got 100% on all of your exams this year? Is there anyone who's done that? And of course, nobody has. Well, is there anybody here that's got 95% on everything? Very few have. So perfection is really, really hard to attain. And I, and I don't feel like you have to be perfect. It's okay. We're not going to be perfect. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find that swim that's within us, that moment that's within us that we can look back at 
years down the road and say, wow, that was a magical moment, man. I hit it almost perfect that day, you know? And so, but you probably, even when, you know, Michael Phelps hit, you know, this swim or that swim and breaks world record, I'm guessing Michael probably says, you know, I think there was some more there if I had just done this. And I think his coaches probably would say the same thing, you know? And um, so I think as a coach, we want to remind people that it, they don't have to be perfect. And we're in search of, I always say uh, excellence is a moving target. So we're in search of excellence, which is constantly in motion. So what used to be good, by the way, guys, when you started here at Ohio State, golly, it's no longer so good anymore. Because we used to be a, you know, 55 breaststroker used to be really good. And now 55 breaststroker doesn't qualify to make our Big Ten travel team. You know, and so I, I think it's important to remind your, your athletes that what we're doing is we're trying to teach you about striving for excellence in your life in every facet of your life. We're trying to teach you about what excellence looks like and that it's a moving target and that the detail of excellence is what you're searching for. So how well can you swim that strategy? How great can you hit those turns? How explosive and what's your line coming off of it? Can you, can you get in and out without pause? And so I think the objective is for us to teach young people about excellence so that they can carry that thinking about what does excellence entail into every facet of their life, including being a parent and, you know, a neighbor and whatever. Excellence is, can you support the people next to you better than somebody else does, right? And, and can you give up a little bit of your time to, to do something for others? How important, Bill, is character development <laughs> in terms of the way that a coach approaches the season? Where does that list on their, where does that land on their list of responsibilities as a leader of young people? So it's interesting that you, you asked that because you know if you were a club coach or a high school coach and the kids go home each night to their family, you would say the character you know, is being built you know, by their family. You know, and they bring whatever character traits they have to your pool. You're going to try to add to those character traits, maybe teach them a deeper level of discipline, a deeper level of what excellence looks like, a deeper level of teamwork and, and uh, selfless behavior and how selfless behavior can really change their life and, and humility. So yeah, every day, every time we went into the, the locker room before a swim meet, one of my favorite sayings before, as we finished our team meeting, I would say to our teams is remember this guys, everyone loves a humble winner. So I was reminding them that they're winners, but they're really a better winner if they're a humble winner. And, and so everyone loves a humble winner is really true. And, and even though we, you know, every now and then we sort of like to watch somebody who is a flashy kind of person is sort of fun to see, you know, but the truth is, is if you talk to Caleb Dressel, Wow, what a humble, amazing uh, young person he is. I mean, he is everything that any parent would want a young person to become, right? And, and uh, he may give off this aura of, you know, I'm the Mr. Tough guy, look at my tattoos, I'm, you know, I'm cool and I'm, you know, unique. But when you get him with little kids and you get him with uh, younger people, he is just a playful teddy bear kind of a guy who just loves kids. He treats everybody with respect and he's just genuine as the day is long, you know? And so we're trying to teach character through uh, every time you can with everybody in your room, right? And character, but you can't make somebody have character. You can just show them what it looks like. And then you can try to get as many people on your team to sort of embody that notion and live like that. And then once the team starts living that like, like that, you know, high quality character people live, then it makes it easier for everyone else to live a high quality character life, right? Absolutely. And you said <clears throat> a few things in there that really resonated with me and um, uh, our friend, Arthur Albiero, who's the head coach the, at uh, Louisville. He says to his team, I want us to be humble, but hungry. So we're, we're humble about the success that we have, but we, there's still something in there we want to drive for more. And I think that's incredibly important. The other thing that, that you talked about was, uh, you know, you're a better teammate, a better neighbor, a better friend, a better parent. The, the, uh, the lessons that we're teaching our athletes 
it trickles down into all these different aspects of their life now and, and much later on. And I think one thing that, that's been most important to me that I learned from the best mentors that I had was that I want our athletes to be as excited about the success of their teammates as they are about their own. And I think that if you are as invested in your teammates' success than you are your own, you're going to have a really successful uh, career in the sport. Would you agree with that? <clears throat> Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think when you can teach, uh, when you can help your team uh, see the greatness in others without losing personal confidence. So I think young people uh, sometimes think that it's hard to recognize excellence of others, as I said earlier, without feeling like that means that I'm recognizing that they're better than me. No, not really. What you're saying is, is that you accept the fact that there are others who are also good. There are other A students out there. There are other great swimmers out there. There are other amazing high quality character people out there and you're recognizing it and you're letting them know that. But probably the, the most, uh, the, the best uh, story that I have on this is I think at the, when we won that big 10 title, I think we got we had three guys in the final and we got one, two, three in a breaststroke, a hundred breast or something like that. But anyway, so we did exceptionally well. And the two guys that were seniors didn't win. The guy who was the junior, Elliot Kiefer, was the, ended up winning the event. And he was in the hundred. He wouldn't have predicted he might win the hundred in the Big Ten because he was not a big guy, stature wise. You know, he's a shorter guy. He's not super, I mean, he was a strong kid for his size, but not super big. And the other two guys were seniors, a little more experienced, and you would have expected maybe one of them might possibly have won that race, but Elliot wins it. So <clears throat> at the conclusion of the race, my eyes are on the two people that were seniors to see how they responded. This was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. So these two young men, Donnie Malnick, you know, you know um, um, they did this. They immediately jumped out of the pool and ran over to uh, celebrate with Elliot Kiefer. And it was Sam Pelkey and Donnie Malnick, and they ran over to celebrate with Elliot. Not one moment, and I, I've told athletes this a lot, not one moment did I see their chins drop, which would be like a sign of disappointment possibly, maybe a sign of, oh man, I didn't have a chance to win on the senior, the junior one, what the heck, I worked harder than him, whatever it is that kids think, right? Uh, you know, I'm better than him. How did he beat me? Whatever it is that they think. Not one time did I see it. Better yet, not one time did they ever come to me and say, coach, man, that was my race. I could, I should have won that race. What do you, why didn't I, not one, we had another race the next day, which was the 200. And uh, that was the only thing they were focused on was teamwork. And so brotherhood or sisterhood can really r raise the level of your group. Um, if you have selfless behavior and kids who celebrate the excellence of others and recognize it as a, a great thing to do, not something that they should be, you know, that they should feel bad about or that, you know, it makes, it demeans them in some manner or lowers them in some manner. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Because that can be a tenuous situation sometimes when your teammates elevate and there might be some expectations and then someone else has a great swim but they're as excited for that person. So uh, it, it's so important. And, you know, it, it's so ironic because you're talking about people who are great teammates and how Caleb is very humble. And as I'm sitting here talking to you right now, he just became the first man to break 50 seconds in the 100 IM. He just went 49.8 <laughs> as we're sitting here and broke the world record in the 100 IM. Amazing. So and you got to figure that's a 4,400 IM. Oh, cl very close. So that was good. That's so cool. So Amazing. Cool. And as you and I both know, a lot of it was underwater. So, I yeah. mean, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, the future of our sport. Now that we have things like the ISL, uh, are you excited by this? Is this another thing that we're going to kind of wrap into our process as coaches now that we have maybe some athletes who come back to our programs after college and they want to have a pro career? Well, so we do know that athletes, there are a lot of athletes who uh, swim a lot longer and a lot at a, a lot later stages in their life now than there once were. Kids used to get out of college and they'd go on the jobs at age 22. <clears throat> now I think people are not in such a rush. If they're doing well, I think they, 
uh, might be encouraged to go on and, and try a couple years after college or maybe go to grad school while they're doing that. And um, so I think that that's a great thing. Uh, the ISL is exciting because, it, you know, we all are, you know, dying for some races, right? And it's really exciting this year, even though it was exciting last year as well. It's really exciting this year because we want to see world-class swimming and we want to see something that inspires and, and leads our thinking to one day that can be me. So I think the great thing about having uh, these events is every young swimmer, I say young, it could be just younger than those people over there, right? It could be 18, it could be 16, it could be 20, but every younger person who's, you know, who's not there is dreaming of doing something like that, whether it be at the NCAAs or the YMCA national finals or high school, you know, uh, state championships to win a title for their team, whatever it happens to be, there's a young person out there who's dreaming of being that excellent, right? And they want to be that person who stands on top of the podium one day or, but you know, again, it's not about, it's the process that really makes the athlete. It's not the athlete that makes the process. So the athlete really sort of uh, learns through life that if they do things well, it leads to excellence. And that's what coaches are trying to, you know, to, you know, to teach young people that, if you do things well consistently over time and you really, really give it up, you pay the price of time, pay the price of effort, pay the price of being coachable, teachable, pay the price of changing, doing things that are uncomfortable. When you pay that price, there's some opportunity for excellence right around the corner. And you might not get it today. You might not get it tomorrow. But one day in your life, it's going to pay a dividend for you and you're going to be rewarded for that. Such an important tenant, right, for coaches today because our athletes are living in a much different world than the swimmers we coached even five or 10 years ago. There's a lot of talk about the, the click generation, and I don't necessarily like to get into those kinds of things uh, as I watch Michaela step up to the blocks here. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to be aware that these kids have a lot of new things coming at them. And they don't necessarily have the attention span to understand the process. So why is it so important for us as club coaches to reinforce uh, the, the process of development and, and that dynamic with our parents? Well, so this generation, <coughs> you know, is considered to be the uh, seven second generation. So, the, the, you know, the, you, you like something, you don't like it, you move on, right? It, you know. And whether it, you know, if you, you know, and if you don't like it, you scroll on to the next thing and you move quickly to the next thing, whether that be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, you just quickly move. You don't like it, you move on past it. Well, excellence is not like that. You have to do things that you don't like and you, and you have to stay with them. And I would say, you know, so engineers are great at that, right? So if you, you know, engineers know how to do mundane things well for a long period of time. Well, swimmer, great swimmers have to learn to do mundane things well for an extended period of time. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that means that everybody has to do super long sets or things like that. I'm not, in, I'm not in saying that or encouraging that. What I'm saying, though, is that mundane things means it's a two-hour hard workout where there's not a lot of conversation uh, other than skill development. And your coaches challenge you. I always say their coaches are challenging you to the very core of your being. And their job is to challenge you. And take today's practice and just accept it as a simple challenge. Um, so whatever the prescription that was written by your coach, and I call it the prescription. So let's assume that, you know, Dr. Mike here, Dr. Bill Dorncott, whoever it happens to be, Dr. Terry McKeever, they write the prescription. And when they write the prescription for their athletes, the better you do that, you do that prescription and the more detail you ha have behind that prescription, uh, athletes are going to succeed at a higher level yeah, because of their faith and their belief in what they're doing. They do that prescription. They take it exactly as it's, it's supposed to be done. They don't typically change it. They typically just stay right on course. And, and they're going to be the benefactor down the road for having learned how to do that. And uh, the rest of their life, you know, there's going to be things that are going to be prescribed to them. And this will really serve them well in life as well. It, it's such a uh, interesting conversation to have with parents when we talk about the trajectory of a career. And uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the parents get very excited at a young age. 
They might have an athlete, a 10, 11, 12 year old who uh, is excelling early in the sport. And we have to mitigate some of that excitement. We can certainly encourage some of it. Um, but what are some things that you can tell coaches in those interactions? Megan Osting did a great talk on uh, age group development. And, and I think she had a catchy title, like, what do I do when my 10 year old is breaking nag records? You know, how do you, how do you mitigate some of that parent enthusiasm and excitement and teach them to trust that process? So I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, they're only one step away from, from uh, having a bad swim. They're only, you know, uh, but they're a lot of work away from having that amazing swim, right? And so um, be, aware, be aware that, the, you know, present victories could be the seeds for future defeats. I think I heard that a long time, time ago, that present victories could be the seeds for future defeats. So sometimes we let these victories get to our self to rethink that, man, we're, we're supposed to always get them and they're supposed to come to us easy and we don't have to work for them. And as a result, we sort of, you know, don't go back and really give our very best. And before you know it, now that becomes a seed for, you know, doing something less, uh, less well, maybe succeeding at, at, a, at a lower level. But I think it's important to remind your athletes that, uh, again, it's all about humility. So what you are today is a really good 12 year old. And you're a very good 12 year old. You're one of the fastest 12 year olds out there, but you know what? There's no Olympics for 12 year olds. And right. even though we think you're that kind of good and one right. day, if you keep at it, you might be able to do some things with that uh, uh, at that kind of a level. The truth is, is that we want you to still uh, be a young lady or be a young girl or be a young boy and enjoy your life, enjoy your friends. We don't want you to just stop doing everything and only think about swimming. So, you know, the best swimmers that I know don't think about swimming 24 seven. Got to have a life. They walk away and they, you know, they put, you know, put the lid on it for the night and they don't think about it and talk about it all day long. Now the word fanatical and fan are connected. And so I've had some fanatical athletes, uh, several of them who've gone on and done extremely good things. You know, Judd Crawford, fifth in Olympic trials, Kevin Kling, big 10 champion, fifth at the NCAAs. They were fanatical guys and they just did, a, a, they worked so doggone hard. They were just almost on the edge of, you know, is it possible to do that? Right. Right. Um, and so I sort of feel like, you know, there are kids and you certainly don't want to temper that when they have a moment where they're just, you know, really crazy excited about their sport. I think you sort of have to go with it. So the old adage of meet them where they are might be a good moment for that. Right. So they're that excited. Let's ride it. Let's go. Janet, who would, what the heck? Let's, let's hope no one changes Janet Evans stroke when she's, uh, 14 years <laughs> right. old. Right. Right. You know, because who would have said that was going to be the ideal stroke for a world record, right? But it became the ideal stroke in her era for a world record that lasted for <laughs> whatever for years, time. right? Amazing time. Amazing. And one of the things that one of my associate head coaches in our program here, uh, Scott Wisner, he swam at the University of Iowa. He was a, a great distance swimmer back in the day. It just brings tremendous uh, perspective to our program being in the sport for a long time. He reminds me about uh, athletes and coaches, health and wellness, and specifically coaches, because he'll say to me, uh, Mike, I don't know if you know, but you were on the deck nine hours today. Like, we just can't, <laughs> we can't do this anymore. Like, you, you need some time. So how important is that? And, and is that something that ASCA is going to address with coaches moving forward? Well, when you say address it, I think each coach has to address it on their own uh, because you can't make somebody do anything. And, you, you know, if you tell somebody don't work hard and they don't work hard and they don't succeed, you can't do that either. Right. And so I think what we can do is we can help take care of one another. Right. And we can provide opportunities for growth and learning through our ASCA uh, educational uh, uh, pieces, whether it be articles or whether it be videos or, um, you know, that really sort of share with a balance in life, a lifestyle balance, the importance of, um, you know, uh, uh, resetting. So what's the great news about, uh, what, what did we learn through COVID? We learned that we can do without swimming for a couple of weeks and 
we'll be okay. And guess what? Most of us are back at it again. Now I feel bad for those who are not back at it again. Right. And, and that's, that's a shame. Um, and we, we got lots of work to do on that, but I do think that, that we learn that we can live without it. And so the, for those of us who didn't think we could, we probably now have a different perspective, right? And so by living through this, so our, our goal will be to help coaches, uh, you know, by providing some opportunities for growth and learning through our, uh, you know, through our website, whether it be in video learning or whether it be by consultation. But I've actually talked to a couple of people about doing some things for us that might be sort of a professional in that field and offering professional services to coaches who have uh, interest or need. Now, like anything, someone who needs uh, something doesn't always recognize it, but you know, if it's offered, then, then obviously, you know, and someone else does it, maybe they'll, it'll be encouraging that, you know, and open up the door of someone's mind that, you know, I need to take a look at a good hard look at what I'm doing on a daily basis and how can I be a better, whatever father, brother, husband, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And am I putting too much into all of my eggs into one basket, you know, and, and missing out on a few things in life that, it, that I should not be missing out on. I certainly would be guilty of that because I've spent my, my, all of my days mostly on the pool deck and working with, with athletes and coaches, right? It can be a challenging dynamic. And, you know, I'm, I'm considering those things as well as, as I grow into my career, but I will tell you as a younger coach, I remember thinking, Boy, I, I've been I've been here since 5:30, and it's now nine o'clock at night, and I'm making West Coast recruiting calls. You know, I, I've I've been in that position, um, and then you know, having kids, you pair it back a little bit, and then as your kids get older, then you ramp it up again. And there's this really interesting arc, and I and I think it's a it's a topic that we need to kind of make more of a common conversation in, in our profession. I think it's really important to remind coaches about, you know, healthy living and, and exercise and, and eating correctly. We've all gone to that hospitality room one or two extra times we didn't need to go, right? We, uh, at that big meet, we've all gone out that last night when maybe we didn't need to go out that last <laughs> night. And, uh, you know, those are, those are important lifestyle things. And I think, you know, with USA Swimming offering uh, health insurance opportunities for the first time for coaches, coaches uh, being more comfortable talking about mental health and wellness. I think it's an important piece for our, our profession moving forward. Uh, no doubt. Uh, mental health and wellness right now in particular, I think everybody has COVID fatigue. You know, gosh, I don't want to put on a mask one more time, you know, and, and uh, I, I actually am getting, I'm being comfortable with a Zoom call because I don't have to wear a mask. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's like, wait a minute. No, I, the Zoom calls are not what I was born to do. But I, don't, I like the face-to-face -face interaction. I love being with you, Mike, and, and being with my compadre friends and my coaching friends and, and standing side by side and having a pop with them or going for a walk with them or, you know, whatever, playing golf if you're a golfer, you know. And so I sort of feel like, you know, that we're missing out on that interaction. That's a personal interaction because of COVID. But but I do think that, that the world is a little bit struggling right now, you know, and I think we have to be sensitive to those folks who might have some needs, right? And so I think I always say an awareness of our surroundings is really important for us to, you know, to uh, remember is that have an awareness of those around you and, and sort of, you know, it's easy to sort of, you know, be you. You know, I think if you can just think about others, put others first, I think that can really be a value to everybody. Absolutely. And, and we're getting down to nitty gritty. So I have two quick fire swimming questions for you. We're going to round it out with these. I'm, I'm excited to hear your response. They have been varied since I've been asking them in March. So here we are. We're in Tokyo 2021. It is the finals of the men's 50 meter freestyle. Is it going to take a sub 21 second performance to take that gold medal. Yes. Okay. Katie Ledecky and someone else. Are we going to see eight minutes broken in the women's 800 free? Ooh, I hope so. I hope so. Katie Ledecky is like so fun to watch. And what an amazing person and what an amazing swimmer. You know, when you see her swim, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, how does it get much better than that? Right. And she, and she swims like a monster, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I certainly hope so. Katie, go get them, girl. 
uh, you know, you talk about Caleb Dressel and the type of person that that he is. She is very similar, you know, humble, hungry, Amazing. represents our sport in the best possible way. We have so many great ambassadors like that, you know, and, and uh, you know, and many of them are overseas right now at this ISL. Um, and yeah, they are. And they're such good examples for young people. Coach, where does the future of American swimming lie? What are you most excited about as, as we look down the line here in the next quad? Well, I love the creativity of our young coaches. And I think that, uh, to be honest with you, uh, our young coaches are, you know, I'm going to say that's where that's where it's at. Right. But I don't want to. I don't want to undermine or belittle the fact that we have the world's greatest, most experienced coaches at the top end. In the history I believe in the history of, of the world swimming experience. So if you think about the number, you know, here's the cool part. They're all ASCA members. I love that. They're all ASCA members. And so, and most of them will pick up the phone for me when I call, which is even cooler, you know? And so um, they're really supportive of helping ASCA grow and develop and do things, good things for coaches. And they're very sharing. And so these world-class coaches are amazing and they're willing to give up their their experience their time their energy to help those underneath them or those less experienced than them or who may not have you know this have had the same opportunities to travel and, and see the world through the eyes of swimming as them but i tell you what this younger generation of coaches ooh, they're good and you know and whether that be the dynamo or Carmo or you know whoever i'm just telling you we have a great group of young coaches out there they're creative they're hardworking. they're on top of things they do unique uh, things and they learn from each other well. So, uh, you know, I'm excited about the future and I'm excited about, you know, helping those coaches get to the edge as well because we can always be better. Absolutely. Coach Bill Wadley, CEO of ASCA, thank you so much for joining us on the Coach's Corner. We were well into an hour and I know we put it, probably could have gone 90 minutes, uh, but thank you so much for your time today. Those of you watching, this uh, recording will be available on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can check out some of the greatest clips from all of our shows on our fitterandfaster.com site. Bill, it was great talking with you. I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy that warm weather once you get back down to Florida. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And uh, go USA and uh, go ASCA. Thanks so much, Bill. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.